welcome to Ravenheart Renditions, and this is Shop Time, and we're talking with Regis Will. How you doing, Regis? Doing well. Good. Well, Regis and I had a chance to to talk a little bit at, uh, I think it was Patrick's booth, if I remember correctly. We were both drooling over some hand tools, and uh, uh, we decided, hey, you know what? We're both out here online. We should do this uh, this podcast thing a little bit, and why don't you why don't you tell them a little bit about your uh, your website? Well, uh, I have a website that I call the uh, the New Yinzer Workshop, uh, which is kind of a little play on you know the New Yankee Workshop. Obviously, <laughs> I hope Norm doesn't find out. Some big lawyers after me. That's okay. The five people that'll listen, they won't tell him. <laughs> Probably not, but you never know. Uh, and um, a lot of people ask me what a Yinzer is, and it's kind of like a local slang term for a, uh, a Pittsburgh native, mm-hmm. uh, which I am. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, all kinds of fun there. And uh, I try to blog about what I'm doing in woodworking and, you know, let people know that, uh, you know, people are doing stuff no matter what kind of space they got or tools they have or whatever. Yeah. You can build them. Well, and talking about the, the space you have, you have, you have uh, if you look on the About Me page, portion of uh, Regis's society as the the about me talks about his shop a little bit and you have a little smaller space than some of us do uh you're saying about six foot head clearance and and how big's the shop itself uh about 13 by 12 Mm -hmm. that that's a little smaller than some of them but uh yeah um it's half a basement Mm -hmm. and uh the one side is kind of bounded by the chimney which kind of goes up through the entire house uh, and then the rest is like just stone walls and, you know, oh, yeah. looks like the basement of your average gulag, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we make do. Yeah. Well, in the, in the most, uh, the most recent, uh, post that I'm looking at out here is talking about changes of plans for workbench. You were, we both, uh, as we said before, both got a chance to go to woodworking in America and you were a little inspired by some of the stuff you've seen, um, going away from the, uh, the French bench to the a little different style, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I had been kind of started on a French bench. I had some legs and stuff like that in the uh, in some oak that I had, and yeah, you know, I was going with slow, and I was still looking for like you know a four inch top to put on that sucker. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I saw the uh, the Nicholson bench that Mike Simpson had uh, in his presentation, and yeah, you know, I was like. Man, I can get construction lumber all the live long day. So, uh, yeah, I decided to go that way. I mean, my last uh, bench was construction lumber, and it's lasted this long. And Mike makes a really good case for it, and uh, it suits my time input requirements as yeah. well. You know, I want to build furniture, not a bench. Well, and and like at uh, at Mike's presentation at Woodworking in America, he talks about, uh, you know, he he can go and buy this buy a bunch of home center lumber and put something together and you know by mid to end of the day he's planing stuff on a finished workbench (laughs) yeah i put uh i just started building it like i tore down my previous bench and you know it was construction lumber so i was able to repurpose some of it and uh i think i got about an hour and a half into the bench and i already got legs and stretchers (laughs) yep (laughs) I got parts to put together, so well, that's pretty awesome. I, I've had a chance to see Mike Simpson's shop, and as many of them are that are in that shop, because he teaches out of there as well, uh, I think he's put together a few more than you and I, so he, he can probably slam them together a lot quicker than us, though. <laughs> uh, I have no doubt about that, but uh, still, super, uh, super straightforward to build. Yeah, and, and extremely versatile. I mean, are, are you going to do the... Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm, I'm not I'm not familiar with the term, but the the block that you pound up as the planing stop. Um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna do a planing stop because I do a lot of planing right now, and that's one of the things I don't have on my current bench. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, the planing stop's gonna be handy. I'm doing the split top. Okay, so you'll be able to have a a, a, a stop actually that would be the length as a bench as well. Yeah. Cool. I don't have a, uh, a planer of any sort, mm-hmm. so it's me and the number five. <laughs> so, uh, and a little bit of sweat and elbow grease. <laughs> more than a little. Uh, so, 
doing that. I'm not doing the same vice that he generally does. I'm I'm doing a leg vice. Okay. Uh, and I'm gonna make it double sided like he makes his because mm -hmm. you know sometimes I've had a couple of friends who were short enough to fit in my workshop, <laughs> so uh, without hitting their heads. So uh, yeah, a partner's bench would be handy. So I'm gonna make it uh, a double right-handed bench. I'm gonna put a uh, stop on each end, uh, and the other side will just have a uh, a hook instead of a vice. Oh, okay, that'd be cool. Yeah, nice. And as you mentioned, you do. Pretty much hand tool work, right? Yeah, for the most part. Um, you know, just because of the the space. Uh, I had, a, at one point, a bandsaw, a table saw, a mortiser, a disc belt sander, a lathe, and a chop saw all crammed into that space. Oh, wow. And uh, that just wasn't working real well. And you probably didn't move very much then. <laughs> No, everything was kind of in the way all the time. Yep. <laughs> so changes were made. Actually, uh, I, actually, I suppose you had to move a lot. You had to move this to move that to get to this to move this to move that. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a, a jigsaw puzzle and Tetris simultaneously. <laughs> all the mill, all the mill lumber. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You have to uh, turn the table saw off to move it so you can finish your rip cut. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, that's probably not the most safe way to do it either. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, it it does make you one heck of a planner when it comes to the flow of a workshop, though. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So there's a there's a few other things you do. I mean, on on uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on your card and on your website, it's uh, your your tagline. It's your traditional woodworker and teacher, saw doctor, keeper of of old knowledge old house fixer and bicycle rider, which um, was kind of fun to, to see another woodworker that did a lot of biking as well. But So the teacher portion, um, we had a chance to talk a little bit before we started recording, and and uh, it's not the, the, the teacher in the traditional sense, but uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about how you go about making sure people learn something? <laughs> well, um, through our uh, local club, the uh, Western Pennsylvania Woodworkers, um, I try to do a couple of presentations a year uh, on you know some some topic that I'm currently interested in. Uh, I've done them on heat treating your own steel, so you know to make blades and stuff like that. Uh, did one on uh, making moldings with molding planes, which was something that uh, a lot of people at our club hadn't really seen before. Oh, cool! Um, and uh, most recently, I did one on the, uh, the the track saws as an alternative to table saw for small shops. Oh, cool. And uh, then sometimes I work with the uh, Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation at their Preservation Resource Center, mm -hmm. uh, showing people how to uh, kind of preserve their woodwork, um, either make replacement parts or repair things uh, so that they know that that's something they can actually do as opposed to having to replace or find, you know, uh, something else to something you know. Something that doesn't exist anymore, but you can make your own. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, uh, when that you, kind of thing. You had talked about, you, you one of them, you showed somebody how to do, redo the molding, but with a, with scratch dock. You, now, did you show the whole how to make the scratch dock and, and how to how to prep it and everything? Yeah, that's, yes, I did. That's pretty um, cool. What what we had, it was kind of like a series of presentations. So what we had acquired was I uh, picked up a door at our local salvage, um, and for the first one we we took the trim molding off of the panel and took the panel out that was broken and you know uh, created a new panel and fitted onto like little rabbited pieces that would be covered by the trim when it was put back on and such. And then we used that actual trim from that door as the template for the new trim that we were going to scratch. Oh, cool. So, uh, and we did it with home center materials. Like I got a tape knife and mm -hmm. some chainsaw files and I, I cut the scraper out of the tape knife <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we scratch and tape knives are blued, so you could kind of scratch the outline right on it. Mm -hmm. And then we just uh, worked to file that down with the uh, 
various mill and chainsaw files and very you know, nice to kind of get an art edge on that and you know went to town from there that's pretty cool yeah i've uh i've, I've made a couple of my own but i still i it's it's a useful tool and skill to do it's just i haven't found the time i guess most it most of the time it's been mm, do i really need to do that i should but no <laughs> well you know i'll usually use molding planes if i'm going to do it myself mm -hmm. uh you know i don't generally bother scratching them unless it's like a curved thing oh sure yeah i suppose Cur uh, curves would be a lot easier yeah <laughs> well, yeah it's a lot easier to you know use a scratch stock on a curved piece than it is to bend a molding mm -hmm. plane. <laughs> so, one specialized uh, plane <laughs> yeah so uh but you know the tape knife i just wanted it to feel accessible to people like i can go out and get these materials any day of the week yeah and and they could no, yeah i bought them that morning i think that's really that's really cool i like that um being able to do that where you say hey you know it's it's not a you have to find a 400 year old piece of whatever and, and do it this specific way and you know shake three times at the moon and make sure it, it it's all accessible same thing with like the nicholson bench it's you know it, is it maybe somebody wants a very specific you know rubo bench or something like that that's fine for whoever wants it but if somebody wants to the nicholson one is easily to put together easily accessible material and yeah. you're done <laughs> Yeah, I've actually been thinking about once I finish my Nicholson, uh, proposing like a bench building weekend with the club to see if uh, people want to, you know, if they need a bench. You can build them any length, any size, you know, and get some people together and maybe get a delivery of lumber from one of the local yards and just build benches all weekend. You know, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah people, people. <clears throat> Excuse me. People like doing stuff like that too. We're getting together, and then they have somebody who's done it before, and you can help each other out. So, yeah, I think it's just getting people over the threshold to build that bench. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and once they once they have that once they have that one, they can see the things that okay, maybe I want to do this differently, or hey, I can add this on, and it's just like that other one or whatever. So it's kind of cool. My original bench, which was based on kind of a Scandinavian style, that you know. I kind of just copied in, you know, construction lumber and plywood. Uh, taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. Taught me about what I wanted in a bench and a lot of what I didn't want in a bench. Yeah, well, that mine too. I mean, the, the one I have right now, um, the base is actually somewhat traditional, um, <clears throat> but one time and and, uh, and availability of the materials and, and the budget for buying. So it's just two sheets of, of three quarter inch plywood on top of it. And they're, you know, they're basically laminated together. So there's one mm -hmm. big piece of plywood, <laughs> but I, I use hold downs. I do, I've got a, yeah. I've got a bench, I've got a vice on the end, everything else. It works, but someday, yeah, I'll probably put a better top on with a split. So I have a better stop, stuff like that. But, it works. <laughs> yeah, it works. I was just kind of, you know, outgrowing it since I got more hand tool-ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when I started building that bench, I don't, I had couldn't really use a plane all that well because, well, I didn't have a bench to use it on. Yeah, it's kind of hard to plane without one. Yeah, without it, without at least a decent stop and and. A yeah. way to secure it <laughs> clamping it to the table saw wing ain't the way to go <laughs> no <laughs> and and don't slip off the end if you do it that way <laughs> yeah for real you'd be sharpening a lot speaking of sharpening and and uh, fixing of things uh you have another section to your website about uh, rescue tools yeah yeah these are tools that find their way to me i don't really like seek them out mm -hmm. but you know people know i'm into hand tools and they're like Oh, I was in my grandfather's garage. I found this, and they, you know, hand me a, a whatever. I mean, number five, <laughs> pretty commonly a number five plane, mm -hmm. uh, which is useful. I try to move those on to people right away. Oh, sure. Uh, or, you know, some transitional plane or a uh, handsaw or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I got... I pretty much settled on what I like and use, so I just try to fix them up and give them a good home if they're if they're fixable. With with uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with my saw addiction, I keep looking at that D twenty three you have listed out there, and 
keep going back to I might have to contact you later on. <laughs> that is a really nice saw. I mean, um, I like a I like a number seven style myself. Mm -hmm. I like a little heavier weight of it, but the D twenty three is a nice saw. It cuts really well. Yeah, and I, I have, that one's like so ready to go. I think there's one spot left in a saw till, so um you know, I'd maybe have to fill that one, but then knowing me, I'll just have to build another saw till and get more saws. <laughs> yeah, saws are, I think, easily the most addictive tool. Yeah, they're um, especially where you can pick up. I mean, it, most of my saws, <clears throat> and I think I've mentioned before to other people about. Um, I have a couple of saws that I bought new. I have a one bad X saw. Uh, and one Windsor that I picked up because there was a defect in it, so I got it for next to nothing. Uh, almost all the other ones are... 90% of the, the remainder of my saws are things that have been in my family or my wife's family for almost 100 years. And when I got them, they were junk. And I re, you know, fixed them up and sanded them down, got all the rust off them, learned how to sharpen saws. And from the time I learned how to sharpen them, I've been addicted to having more of them. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have one family saw, mm. which uh, I got from my grandfather, who I actually did some woodworking with as a, uh, as a teenager. And uh, it's actually a really interesting saw. It was made for, it has an etch on it from a Pittsburgh... Uh, hardware store. Oh, that's cool. And it's it's uh, definitely made by Richardson. Oh, cool. And it's like a, a number seven style with the handle off the back and the nib. Mm -hmm. So it's a really cool saw, and I think it's like a a nice twelve point cross cut. Cool. So twenty six inch. And I've <clears throat> excuse me, I have I have a bunch of different ones, and they're some of them still have. Well, there's a couple of them actually that still have the full etching, and they're almost like a brand new saw that, you know, was produced a hundred years ago. And you're like, nobody ever touched this thing. This is awesome. <laughs> there's some of the other ones that you look at and you go, someone loved this dearly and sharpened it many, many times. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't have any that are like super crispy, mm. but uh, I got some pretty decent ones. Cool. Yeah, yeah. They, they do the work. And, and mine, I mean, it, granted, I I do a lot of a power tool work yet and you know a, a lot of the stuff that would i think you and i i think i mentioned it before is if it's going to make me sweat i generally turn on a switch instead but when it comes to getting stuff i have a basement shop as well and getting long boards when i don't need a long board down into the basement is just ridiculous i have to try to you know bend around corners and everything else i'll break everything down upstairs and then bring down the pieces that i need and then let them acclimate to the shop that way and i mean uh. Doing it with a handsaw is so much safer because there's a little bit of tension somewhere and that circle saw wants to jump. And I'm like, no, it's it's quicker, safer, and all the sawdust falls straight down. <laughs> yeah, that is a nice part. Uh, I luckily have a back entrance to my uh, basement. Oh, so you can bring the full boards down. <laughs> I can bring actual stuff in there uh, as long as it's not in one major dimension, six feet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I can get stuff in and out pretty nice. Oh, sometimes I do a lot of work out in the backyard just because it's nice. Yeah, and, and up until when it gets cold, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is right about now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's getting there here. Wisconsin likes to, you know, decide that it wants to be winter and then about – Somewhere between now and Thanksgiving, we'll get one week where we're not sure if winter's going to come because it all of a sudden heats up and then it really hits us. <laughs> yeah, I think we're having that week today. It was like 65. Yeah, no, it didn't, it didn't warm up here yet. We got about another week, I, I'm guessing. <laughs> well, I think uh, when we started it, we said we, we had a chance to connect to Woodworking in America. And uh, uh, have you been to Woodworking in America previous to this one? Uh, I had gone for the marketplace two years ago. Okay. Uh, but this was my first year as an attendee. Oh, cool. So, so being a, and I've been all but, I didn't make it to the very first one that was out east. Um, from the time they were in Chicago until now, I've been to all of them. And I love it. Uh, one, you know, the, the classes to me are amazing. The, the camaraderie between the people, the marketplace is awesome. Yeah, every part of it to me is is that whole. It's a woodworking weekend, and it's a blast. So, being first time being a full attendee, what'd you think? 
Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, it's just hard to decide what you want to see and do. Oh, there is so much going on. Because kind of stuff is packed pretty tightly together. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so uh, you know, have to pick and choose. And mm-hmm. yeah. and we picked we picked a few of the same things. Um, you got to see some stuff I didn't, and vice versa. So uh, uh, I guess one of the first thing class wise, uh, we both went to Mary May's uh, carving life into leaks life into leaves presentation. Um, and I I thought it was great. I'm I'm a pretty beginning carver and uh and it, it was it was fun watching her <laughs> yeah i'm just getting kind of interested in carving as a way to uh add to some of my stuff mm-hmm. you know i don't know if i generally want to do really realistic carving or not but i was just kind of like interested in seeing the the tools and what maybe you need to get started and you know some technique and stuff like that and to to see carving I think is to learn more than to read carving. Yes. Um, so, and it really made me, she made it feel very accessible. She's very relaxed about it. And it's like, it's wood. Sometimes it forces you to change your mind. <laughs> yeah. Watching the, uh, the, the, the presentation, like you said, it, it, it made, I've, I've done, uh, like small figure carvings. <clears throat> and my very first one in the class was I made a fish, and it actually looked like a fish, so I was happy about that. <clears throat> but I had never really done relief carving, like some some of what she was doing, or or the three dimensional, but but on a flat back kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And and I've been interested in it, like you said, to to add to your woodworking stuff. And it, it was it was one of them where you're like, well, okay, I'm not gonna be at that level right away, but this is doable. I, okay, I understand what I need to do. Um, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it's obtainable at some point. So it, it, I thought she did a great job and, and I, I look forward to seeing her again. Yeah. I thought the other thing that was really good about her presentation was she made it real obvious that you really only need four to six tools to really do most of the carving work. Yeah. Or, yeah. At, or at least here to get started, if you have this handful of tools, you can do something. You will learn yeah. how to do what you have to with the tools you have and then specialize once you know. <laughs> right. And I think that's very handy because mm-hmm. I think, you know, we get uh, a little bit of gear acquisition syndrome, you know, right off the bat. And, you know, oh, I need all 800 sweeps and profiles. <laughs> no, you know, you don't. Yep. Well, in um, a different, there's one that I got to go to, but I, I think you said you weren't able to attend. The uh, Peter Ross did uh, a presentation that he called Historic Tools. <clears throat> and uh, he started out talking about a lock, mm-hmm. and we're all kind of sitting there wondering what the what's going on with this presentation because I was talking about tools and you're talking about a lock, and it was more about this one lock was made several times by the same person, but they never batched it out. They might have batched out parts of it, but then the end part was individually fit to make sure it worked the way they needed it to do. And for example, one part is bent. And by design, that should be straight, but you had to bend it to make the lock work. And nobody would see it. And it was more of a, instead of approaching things as everything has to be this way, it's what does it have to do to function? And instead of going off of the, um, as he put it, the industrial mindset, to step back a little bit, and unless you're batching something out and manufacturing something, why does it have to look that way? Can it change? Can it? You know, it was just a different way of coming about thinking about what you're doing. And he handed, <clears throat> he sent around several uh, chisels and and pictures of chisels and how they're not perfect. And these are hundreds of years old, and these things produced amazing furniture, but they're not perfect. But the edges. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, that artisanal mindset mm-hmm. versus the industrial mindset that we that we have now. And, you know, I think that's a, a, a challenge for us as people who make, make stuff. Yeah. That's, like, individualized. Yep. You know, I'm not, I'm not making a run of 500 at anything. No. And whatever I make is not going to be perfect. I'm lucky if I make a run of five or something, usually. <laughs> yeah. 
and you know, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you're working at a level that artisans work at. Yep, you're not a machine. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and as he put it, the people that made these things that he was showing the the um, <clears throat> the chisels that he sent around and and the different ways that things were formed and it, it was yeah they 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 made a living doing this, but they realized that. You know that crack that they have up at the top doesn't change the function of the chisel in any way, so it can still be sold. It's okay. And there's a bunch of stuff they went through like that about the different thickness of the blade and, and different things, but it's fully functional. It's fine. Don't you know? And, and we obsess about some things that don't really matter, but some of the function part of it, it's like form and function go together, but there's a different way of looking at it. I, I actually hope that he uh to see some more presentation like that it was really cool <laughs> yeah i think that's interesting i yeah i was very torn on whether i was going to see that one or not mm -hmm. i thought about it and then i still had to go to that one <laughs> now you had a chance to see one that that uh one of the one of the people that i consider one of the more entertaining people and educational you you got to see uh, uh peter follinsby do the the carved spoons right yeah, he was up against the historic tools presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and you know, Peter, I had seen him just briefly at the uh, at the place that they have down at the uh, marketplace a couple years back. And I follow his blog, and he's just a very witty guy and always great to watch. So, um, you know, I don't even know if I'm interested in carving a spoon from Greenwood. But, <laughs> You know, there's something good about watching a guy who can really handle a hatchet. You oh, know? yeah. <laughs> the man can handle – he's just so entertaining to watch and yet so competent yeah. with what he's doing. You know, it's it's great. Um, I love every minute of it, and uh, I wish I could relive his diatribe on Pottery Barn not selling pottery. <laughs> but I don't think I could even do it justice. He uh, – he stopped in because he thought they would sell it like a the standard crappy wooden spoon we all own mm -hmm. uh, as an example of what not to make. <laughs> and was befuddled when they did not have any pottery or kitchenware whatsoever. <laughs> He's like, but the sign, pottery. No, no, no pottery There's here. There's no pottery. <laughs> it sounds like something he would come out with too. It was, oh my God. He, he is so entertaining. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, and I might carve a spoon. At least I learned some interesting things about, you know, using a hatchet and using a knife and mm -hmm. that's stuff I usually do, so and it's stuff that you have to see. Oh yeah. I really tried to focus on stuff that you that was good visually and not just you had to you could read somewhere. Yeah. Well, and, and another one that, that is entertaining to, and I, I got a chance to, to go to his classes before, but Mike Seamson did the, the Thrifty Woodworker presentation. And uh, I, I think one of the funniest things is when he had the, uh, I think it was the jigsaw that someone had given him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he took the blade out of it and he says, hey, this would work good for, uh, I don't remember what he was going to do with it, but he's going to do something with the blade. He oh, cut, cut, cut the cord off, said, yep, I can use that to hold up my pants and threw the rest out. <laughs> yeah, that, that was kind of brilliant. I'm like, uh, that's totally Mike. <laughs> for me, I thought that presentation was one of the best ones of the weekend. It, it, and it, it I, was. And I really thought that it was more people should have attended it because I think it's a good reality check mm -hmm. for everybody to go. Yeah, I could buy an infill plane, but I can make a lot of shit without one. Yeah, pretty much. It's and I like the the uh, he showed the um, the dovetail making kit. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll just call it that for a minute about. Uh, what he had people try to do dovetails with at the hand tool Olympics once. Um, it was a, a hacksaw, a board with a screw in it, um, a screwdriver, and a ground down screwdriver. And your ground down screwdriver was your chisel. You use the 2x4 with the screw in it. The side of it is your mallet. You use the Phillips to adjust the screw because that was your uh marking Marking gauge <laughs> and the hacksaw was just as fine toothed as any other one and he says honestly he had people come up that you know some of the i don't remember i think he said chuck bender and somebody else that used it and they said you know actually it works pretty good <laughs> yeah, i said rob cosman said that that was it cosman that's i remember now yeah. <laughs> 
like Mr. Dogtail. Yep. <laughs> he says, you know, it's not too bad. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Mike Simpson, we both also had a chance to uh, to play in the uh, the hand tool Olympics a little bit. Um, I didn't do quite as good as you, as I've heard. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I thought it was sheer dumb luck. You know? <laughs> well, you won you won one of the events. It was the uh, the um, edge joining. Edge joining. That's it. Um, I, I actually surprised myself. Uh, I I did uh, did the dovetails pretty quickly, and and they did they weren't too bad. They can only get I think it was two cards, no three cards in. Uh, my dovetail, you could have put a deck of cards. In. <laughs> that was my more. That was my tenon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, the the dovetail. I can cut these. It was the worst one I had ever made. <laughs> I'm surprised it held together. It's as soon as somebody watches, you're like, oh, no, what did I do? That's what I did with my tenons. I'm like, no. I cut tenons at home. And I think part of it is I really take my time at home and make sure that everything's going just right on those tenons. Because I don't want to have to do any more fitting than I absolutely have to. And uh, my my dovetails fit better in the hand tool Olympics than they normally do at home. And my tenons were awful. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I, heard, I hardly ever dovetail. So I'm a careful dovetailer at home. Uh-huh. And yeah, dovetailing for speed. You don't want me doing that. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, my tenon was good because I, I do a lot of tenoning. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty good. But. Well, I, I um, you ended up winning a plane because of the edge joining, and uh, um, and I ended up uh, doing the the door prize, the raffle prize actually, and I got from from. Uh, uh, Tools for working wood. I got the, the set of spoon bits and uh, the brace to go with it. So the brace I have at home, I like. I'm keep gonna keep using my own brace instead of theirs. But or instead of the, it wasn't actually a tools for working wood brace. It was just an extra one they had. But those spoon bits, I can really see using them more than I would have thought in before using one at the at the event. So that was the first time I'd ever used a spoon bit. So I was kind of like, huh, that's interesting. They're not easy to draw a square with, but I mean. On the other hand, that's not really what they're for. Yeah, no, you can do just about anything. You can turn it in the middle almost. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so that that is kind of cool. Mm. Um, yeah, and the winning the plane was kind of a cool thing, but I think I really won it in the rip competition. Oh yeah, when you if yeah when you have to start with the rip and then join it. I mean, you you got to yeah. saw it straight in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, I I rip pretty well because I do it fairly often. Mm-hmm. So even though my rip wasn't fast, it was square and straight. Yep. So, uh, you know, I only had to take two passes with the joiner plane, and it was done. <laughs> you know, I had to take quite a few more passes with mine. But my ripping by hand is generally, okay, I have to stay on, this, on the right side of that white chalk line that I threw on there, and then I'm going to fix it later anyway. <laughs> so... Um, well, that was pretty much the full first day of Woodworking America, and then uh, the the second the second day that that uh, that I went back there. Um, you actually said you had a, a chance to see. El, uh, ne- it's pronounced Eiler. Eiler. I never say his name right. I always want to say Elger, but Eiler. it's not right. <laughs> Eiler. Um, yeah, and the rest of it I can't pronounce. It's something West. Uh huh. But uh, he. I went to see his chair presentation because I've been interested in making some chairs. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to see what he was all about. And, uh, man, he was a really engaging speaker. Very interesting guy just in general. Um, You know, how he came to be a woodworker and his ideas about woodworking and Mm -hmm. various other philosophies. It's kind of hard to describe, but... Very interesting guy, and he finally taught me something that I've been dying to learn how to net do. And what's that? Sharpen a scraper. Oh, nice. Yes, when you learn how to sharpen the scraper, it is it is a wonderful day. <laughs> Burnishing it like I had to bend it in half. Oh, yeah, no, light and pressure. Burn, and he burns you just like that, da, 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 like real quick, just on one side and then the other, and I'm like, Man, I've been putting like 380 pounds of force on the bit. <laughs> I'm probably bending the hook over so far it's pointed back at the scraper. <laughs> yeah, no, that would, uh, yeah, that at least that's a good one to pick up anywhere, no matter where you go. I didn't actually get a chance to see him uh, in his presentation, but uh, one nice thing was on, 
And Saturday evening, uh, before, actually after all the other festivities were done, uh, I actually got to sit down and have a beer with him. He's, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> yeah, a great guy. I wish I would have gotten to talk to him more. Um, I don't know where they found him for when working in America. Mm -hmm. I guess College of the Redwoods. but Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I thought he was like a, a sleeper presenter, you know. Yeah, he's he's just a he's a great guy. I I, I hope they have him back because I'd I'd love to see uh see some of his presentations as well. Yeah, um, his one on uh, you know doing work for clients on Sunday mm -hmm. was very interesting, and he pretty much took you from soup to nuts. He did not hold anything back. That's you know? great. He started with his taxes. Oh wow! <laughs> How much money he made making wood, doing woodworking. That's awesome. <laughs> He's like, I made twenty three thousand dollars doing woodworking last year, and how did I come by this lucrative proposition? <laughs> I'm like, wow! I way to lay it on the line. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I actually, uh, on, on Sunday, I, I ended up uh, going to see uh, Chris Schwarz doing the uh, toolboxes and workbenches from Home Center Materials, which, right, right along with uh, with what Mike Seamson was saying, you know, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, how fancy can you make certain things or... You know, you can use the the one by or not the one by, but the two by material from from the home center. It, you know, there's ways to make it work for a workbench. You can use. The, he talked about a couple different tops that he used. He actually had one that that he had laminated together, um, and said, "In the first one with fifty bucks takes fifty bucks, and a truck takes it home." And somebody's like, "Seriously?" And he goes, "Yeah." So he goes, "Okay, I'll buy it." He goes, "I'll help you load it later." <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? It was it was great. It was a really it was a good show as always. Um, so is there any? I think you said you got a chance to see Roy Underhill present too. And other than the dinner on uh, on, I didn't get a chance to see Roy this uh, this trip. Yeah, I saw Roy's presentation on. Uh, I think it was called Mighty Mitered Breadboard Ends. Oh, okay. Which was kind of more or less breaks down into doing a plush sided frame and panel job. The, the braid, that's breadboard ends. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, the panel is the table and, you know, with some splines and stuff like that. But it's just watching Roy. Yeah. Do what Roy does. <laughs> Roy being Roy. <laughs> Roy being Roy. And, you know, being a person who presents mm -hmm. uh, in front of people, I appreciate watching Roy oh, yeah. uh, do what he does because he, he engages the audience so thoroughly. And and handles people and hecklers very well. <laughs> he, heck, he heckles the hecklers. <laughs> the hecklers, and they're sorry they heckle. And yeah, and he does it well. <laughs> yeah, but just you know, doing the crazy stuff he does, like he's taking the camera and mounting it on the side of the plane, so you can see the shaving come out as as it's going by. And yeah, <laughs> like who thinks of this? Oh, that's awesome. He he has some fun. It's it's great. Oh, he has a great time. And, and uh, one of the other ones I got a chance to see is uh, Precision Joinery in a Hurry. Glenn Huey did that one, and that was another one where it was really, it was fun because instead of just doing the normal presentation, he says, "Is there anybody who hasn't done something like this before?" And so I'm like, "Well, you know, somebody raised their hands. Well, come up here. Let's you know, walk them through doing it. Here's how you do this. Here's how you plunge it down. Here's how you run through. You know, it had them up there working with power tools and, and showing them. It, see, this guy's never done it. It's not that hard." <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. Uh, when I present, I always like to get people involved as much as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, like when we were doing the scratch stock when. Uh, I was getting people up doing some filing, doing some, you know, a little bit of hand sawing that we did, stuff like that. I'm like, you know, I got 20 people in the audience that have never used a hand saw that was sharp. Yeah, yeah, and there's a total, like, there's a total difference. <laughs> this is like, this is, you know, I can, I can change somebody's world right here, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome to get people up and doing stuff. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Mm. That's... I mean, it can run into chaos if you're not careful. Yeah, you have to you have to time it just right. But getting yeah. somebody up there and it, it actually has the other people 
more interested because oh hey wait a minute this guy's doing it maybe maybe it is a little more interesting than i thought or hey he can do it i gotta pay attention to this other part <laughs> yeah i mean he can do it and he's not that guy up there who who's, to... who's been doing this for how long yeah, yeah for whatever <laughs> yep. yeah i'm like uh, so I also got a chance to see Ron Hawk, um, uh, do the perfect edge, uh, pretty much, you know, Ron talking about different steels and, and different ways of doing some of the sharpening, obviously talking about his book. Um, always a great presenter to see. Um, trying to think if there's any other of the presentations, I think that's the bulk of what I went to. Oh, Rich, Rich, Rich Weld, Weldler, sorry. He, um, he, he's, uh, part of the, the company. Um, oh, I can't think of the name of the company right now. Uh, Microfence. And Microfence uh, Edge Guide System. And he kind of showed how to use his different products with, I mean, and they make stuff for big, the big routers, the trim routers, all the way down to like Dremel size stuff to do real precision work with it. And it was, um, his presentation was kind of kind of a commercial for his products, but at the same time showing here's how you can do some of these things. And even if you didn't use his products, there's stuff you could apply to other things at home too. So, yeah, I think you know, no matter who you're watching, you can always find something to apply to your work. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is nice, you know. It's just different ideas and whatever. Oh, and, and a huge part of woodworking in America for me is the whole. You have the chance to connect with some of the people that. You don't get to talk to all the time. Um, different woodworkers, you know. You, you and I met. You, know, you had a chance to to meet and connect at Woodworking America. I've, you know, um, Patrick Leach and Ron Hawk and Chris Schwarz and Mike Seamson. You know, all those people and people they look at for advice for things are sitting in these audiences and, and listening to people and talking about stuff. It, yeah, it, it's, it, it's incredible. The camaraderie and the the openness and and just communication amongst people woodworking america is is more than just going and watching people talk the marketplace is amazing for me <laughs> i have to say that i i felt that the marketplace alone two years ago was worth the trip from pittsburgh oh, you know? i'm sure that they're gonna love to hear that one <laughs> i i think it would be too um because it, i mean it's amazing you can if you just stand in patrick's booth and listen to him talk to people you'll know more about old tools than you ever want to know. Oh yeah, yeah. He, that that man is a wealth of knowledge that I couldn't even. I yeah. I, I at one time thought I knew a lot about handsaws, and then I asked him some questions, and I'm like, okay, yeah. I need to learn some more stuff. <laughs> yeah. Or you know, like that first year I met Matt Bickford, Patrick, uh, man, uh, the guys from Old Street Tool. Mm -hmm. Um, I know their names and I can't think of them for <laughs> at all. Yeah, just tons of people. The the guys from Tools for Working Wood, and everybody's so friendly and so ready to talk. You know, and I just I learned a ton just going to the marketplace. Really, I did. Yeah, without even attending the classes, you're still going to learn. And and the the other part with that is it it's not just that you're there and kind of soaking it in. You know, like you were saying, Ron Hawk and uh, the the one year Chris Wong was there, and you know Shannon Rogers had a booth, different things. Yeah, you know, anybody out there in that whole marketplace are more than willing to. You ask a question, even if you're not buying something, they're going to give you the answer. They're going to walk you through it. They have as much passion for it as the people they're buying the tools. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, you know, just uh, Matt Bickford. He gave me a, a whole rundown on, you know, the hollows and rounds and what to look for. And he wasn't even trying to talk me into buying his planes. You yeah. know, he was like, if you're buying a vintage set, because yeah. Yeah, he's on this planet. He knows not everybody has $3,800 for a set of planes. <laughs> you know? Yep. He wants people to be engaged in working wood and find what he found. Mm -hmm. You know? And I, I just think that's great. Yeah, it's... it's uh... Now, you said you went to. Now, I, I ended up on uh, when I got there. I went to um, the Modern Woodworking Association had a meet up uh, the the night before, and then on uh, I think it was Saturday, uh, the Matt, Mark, and Shannon did the kind of the 
it ended up being like a podcasters. Everybody got together. It was a wood talk meetup, but everybody was there. Um, you actually got a chance to go to the uh, Chris Schwartz with the with the Rubo book. Um, yeah, um, I actually got into town just in time for it, um, which was nice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was really interesting. It was a little chaotic. You know, tons of people there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I eventually got a seat and fell in with some pretty cool guys and chatted with them for a while about, you know, the book and what's going on with, uh, you know, um, Don Williams and, you know, what kind of new stuff they're working on. And, you know, just, you know, really uh, getting into the the mindset of the whole woodworking in America experience for the weekend. You oh, know? yeah. Get started it all right. <laughs> plus, uh, plus awesome pizza and beer. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, there, so there's a lot of pizza. And, and uh, actually, if you go to the one – um, the one that the the modern woodworkers and the uh, wood talk did. There's a lot of macaroni and cheese because they have they're known for their mac and cheese. So <laughs> yeah, the uh, the pizza at Ottavola was amazing. Uh, the guy who owns it is apparently a woodworker, and he built all the tables. Oh, cool! In the in the place, they're kind of in a Nakashima live edge kind of style. Nice. Uh, so that's really nice. The pizzas were awesome. Uh, Brussels sprout and bacon was killer. <laughs> Sounds um, good. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Anything but, with uh, bacon is always good. <laughs> and then just, you know, talking about the, the Rubo book and, you know, what that, you know, really means. I think it's a really important thing that they're doing to bring that to uh, to the English audience. Yeah, I in, in just a, a couple weeks ago, I had, I had a, a, the opportunity to talk with uh, Chris Soares, and it was – we had a, a conversation before we, the recording, and some of some of the stuff that's that's coming in the in the next books, um, and and bringing that level of he was saying that that there's stuff in those books that in legal things right now quality is based on things that came from those books. Yeah, and I'm like, that's just amazing. <laughs> that is amazing, and I'll tell you what. Um... Yeah, I am so looking forward to the architectural woodworking version of that, should they do it. Yeah. Uh, I'm super excited for that, you know, and, you know, I don't know, uh, you heard of uh, George Ellis? The name's familiar for some uh, reason. At the... Modern Practical Joinery. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. That is an awesome book for the English speaking among us. <laughs> For uh, for you know, uh, architectural woodwork, and so I just want to see what the century before had to say. Yeah, that's around like 1890, but also a great book. Cool. Yeah, I'll have, the, to, I'll have to look into it. <laughs> the, uh, the old guys know what they were doing, and they did it. They did what they did, and they did it very good. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it's still sitting here for us yeah. to go, hey, they did that. Yeah, a lot of we look at it and go, how did they do that in some cases? <laughs> Many. So other than that, I mean, that's pretty much woodworking in America other than uh, other than the trip to and from. I mean, we between you and I, we've seen a lot of the different presentations. We've seen a lot of the, the different presenters. We both did the uh, Hand Tool Olympics, and we both got to do a, a, quite a few connections. And, uh, and I'm glad we actually got this one so we could uh, sit down and talk on here. <laughs> yeah, this was great. I, thanks for the opportunity. Hey, no problem. Um, well... If uh, if I don't talk to you between now and then, I hope I see you at the network, next Woodworking in America. Both of us make it down, and hopefully we can uh, we can connect and uh, uh, do something again between now and then. That would be great. Okay. Well, hey, we'll thanks thanks a lot for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll do it again. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.